again, let's start. Ni hao. <laughs> I'm Ankit, um, and a bit about myself, uh, I work as a senior software engineer at Red Hat, uh, and I talk about online data privacy um, uh, through Mozilla. I'm a Mozilla tech speaker. Uh, so I'm, uh, so I'm going to talk in this space so that everybody understands. If somebody does not understand something I'm saying, please raise your hand and we'll stop and we'll try to interact. Okay. Uh, at any time, if you if you feel if you want to ask any questions, please stop me any way you want. Uh, so yeah. privacy has been like mama hoo hoo for, for everyone, right? But uh, it is really hen jong ya, right? Yeah, it's, it's really important because uh, nowadays, it's a, uh, so the thing is, uh, one, of the, one of the speakers that I was attending a talk with uh, talked about privacy in this sense. He said that if someone in this room does not care about their privacy, take a piece of paper, write your email address, write the password to it, and give it to me. And I'm gonna read your emails and post anything I like onto the internet. Are you okay with that? And nobody did it, right? And that's how uh, privacy and security go together. That's why privacy is so important. So uh, we, as users, are normally unaware of how our data is being used. Every time we are using a free service, we think that that service is free of cost, but essentially they are using our data for their advantage and make money, right? Whenever you're paying for something, you're basically exchanging a service for some financial uh, token, for example, money, cryptocurrency, or anything. But if you're not giving money, if you're not giving cryptocurrency, then basically you're exchanging it for your data. And what do they do with this data? What they do is they collect all this data and they profile you. For example, they will train some AI models, some NLP models to understand what you might like in future for something that you have bought today or something that you saw today. For our example, if you go on a social media site like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and you're liking something, you're commenting on something, this means you're generating data points for them to understand what are you interested in, so that they can train their models to know what you might be interested in into the future. This is a base use case. This can go widely to any level you want. The most extreme use case you can think of is maybe uh, thinking about AI-based criminal justice. What if they have a profile of you? When I say they, the governments, the enterprises, that are collecting your data. So when they have this information of you, and what if this information is being used against you into the code to understand if you had committed the crime or not? How horrible is that, right? So this should not be allowed. Now, in this today's world of technology, we do not know who is tracking our data, what they are doing with it. So the best thing we can do is change our habits for better privacy. So let's discuss that. As I said, what do they know about you? They know a lot of stuff about you. A single data point, like if you if you saw your friend's profile picture with the dog, and you find, oh, so cute, let me give a like, and you give a like to it. This has generated three major data points in my point of view. There are multiple more. Number one, you want to make your friend know that you like. Number two, you are really happy that there is a dog there, so you like dogs. And number three, maybe you want a dog yourself. So the first advertise you might get is, see, I sell dogs, would you like to buy it? Right? So simple. It's very simple to understand how data can be used. So I'm just taking a small example of Google. Every, everybody uses Google here, right? Who does not use Google? Awesome. <laughs> okay, for everybody else, let's talk about what do they know about you. If you go to any of these links, you will get your personal data 
that Google wants you to know, right? They are collecting a lot of data, but they are showing you some of the data. For example, maps, for example, your activity, your ad settings, and your account. You can actually go to all these URLs and you'll get a personalized data collection points. All, the, all that data is there for you to see. You can even ask Google to delete it if you are under any of the GDPR uh, European nations. But an, I don't know if GDPR uh, is here, but in India it is not and we cannot change it. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if you want to take out your data, Google is not going to delete it, but it can at least tell you that this is your data, right? And all that information is into policies.google.com. Every time the policy changes, they tell you that the policy has changed. And this is a normal uh, uh, a workflow for every company that has a privacy policy. How many people here have read one privacy policy full, like a complete privacy policy? Awesome. How many people haven't read it? Privacy policy, anybody? Okay, when we install a software, there is a small box that says, I agree. <laughs> right? How many people have checked it without reading? Awesome. Basically, what you are telling them is, I agree to whatever you say. Right? There, there, there might be a sentence that says, all your property from now on is mine. And you have just said, I agree. You have digitally signed it. Just to use a software that was free or you, you gave money for it. Right? Mostly it's free. So I would suggest, after this session, you should at least read one privacy policy and think, do you not agree with something in there? And just think about what all privacy policies you have agreed to. And from now on, if you think I agree, at least read it a bit till you get bored because it's all uh, legal language, right? It's not very user friendly. They do not want it to be user friendly. Why do they do it? Because they want to make money. For example, how many people use Facebook and Instagram? Everybody? Do you pay for Facebook? No, it's free of cost, right? But Facebook is still making billions of dollars. How are they doing it? Ads. Ads, very nice. Ads. How do they know what ads to show you? Because as, for example, I'm a company, right? Um, say I sell beauty services. Now I want specific type of people as my target audience. I want men and women who are under, say, 40 years of age, 30 to 40, and who are interested in, say, makeup and haircuts, right? I tell this information to Facebook, and Facebook exactly knows which people are these, because uh, they are profiling everybody. They are, they are tracking everybody. What are they doing? Are they, are they interested in makeup, haircuts? Are they really fashionable, right? And then they know these people, and then when they get my ad, they'll only show these people my ad. Maybe specific people from Taiwan, maybe specific students from the NTU. So how does this all work? From where does this all come from? Whenever you are using a web browser, there is something called cookies, right? These cookies are storing information about all the websites that you're visiting. Normally, the way the internet should work is every website should have its own cookie. Okay? And this cookie should store information to help you. So that next time you come onto the website, the website is able to help you go forward from where you left. But cookies are more than that. If you take a website that is trying to track you, that is trying to understand what you are doing on other websites, right? So what they will do? It, it will try to read the cookies from other websites, right? And then collect that data and store it. Should it be allowed? What do you think? It should not be allowed, but it is what's happening, right? Because there is no way of stopping this up till now. There is a way to stop this. We'll get there in, uh, in the next slides, okay? So just to, uh, right now for the information, cookies is something that is taking your information. So the next time you feel like you should clear your cookies, do that, right? There is an option in every browser, clear cookies. Do that every time you want. 
There's something called as online tracking. This is how, this is the second way they are doing it. Online tracking means whenever you are going onto a website, that website is giving all your information to other websites. Right? I'll give you an example. Many a times you must have seen there is there is a website, say there is a blogging website, and there is a small Facebook like button. Right? When when you click that. What happens is it basically sends all the data from, from that blogging website to Facebook. There may be Google. It is called as widgets, small widgets, right? And those small widgets basically take information. Now, there are ways to stop cookies. There are ways to stop online tracking. So, browsers, are, I mean, sorry. Companies still have to make money. They have to f reinvent themselves every time. Now, this is the latest thing that they're trying to do. It's called browser fingerprinting. It's been there always, but now it's been talked about more. What is browser fingerprinting? Browser fingerprinting means every person's browser can be uniquely identified. How can they identify it? Is my browser same as yours? Maybe. You might be using Google Chrome, but you might be using Google Chrome in a different resolution. Maybe 120 by 786. Maybe on your phone. So resolution is different. You might be using different add-ons on your computer. right? So that is also unique. Then the color of your browser may be different. Your OS may be different. Even your location from where you are using your browser most of the time is different. So, companies can actually browser fingerprint you to the level of 99.99% accuracy. They know exactly whom this browser belongs to. So, there are three things that can happen through data. Number one is data theft. It's a real life problem today. If someone basically tries to steal your data, tries to steal your information, they can do anything with it. For example, if you are into cryptocurrency and you have, say, a key, and you have put it online somewhere, this can actually happen. Someone can steal your identity through your data and get to that key and steal your money. Same as with your banks. Secondly, people send you ads because as we talked about Facebooks, it's the same thing. Profiling is something that we talked about. Everybody is profiled in a specific way. Are they a student? Are they an adult? Are they interested in specific things? Do they like Nike shoes or Adidas shoes? Are they wearing a specific uh, brand clothes more than anybody else? All that information is being profiled. Okay, so it would be very, very weird if I, if I only talk about problems and not the solutions, right? So let's talk about solutions. The most important thing that we need to do to protect our privacy is change our habits, change our preferences. <coughs> How many people use Firefox? Firefox browser? Awesome. There is, I'll tell you the reason you should switch to Firefox. But does anybody know what this is? Oh, oh. Oh. Right? Onion browser. This is the most secure browser today, as if you are following the guidelines that Tor is telling you to. Why? Because it, it has inherent VPN and it uses onion routing. That's a discussion for another day. But yes, if possible, and if you want to be anonymous online, try using Tor. Tor is a bit slow, it takes a lot of uh, bandwidth of yours. If you, if you do not have a lot of internet to spend, try using Firefox. On mobile phones, try and use Firefox Lite. Firefox Lite is the new browser from Firefox on mobile phones that takes less bandwidth and also gives faster results. But if you are really uh, into privacy and you do not want any of your data to remain in the history or no cookies, use Firefox Focus. This is the mobile browser for iOS and Android. Firefox Lite is only available for Android right now. 
So fire up slide and focus. Give it a try. Okay. So let's let's try and uh, do a demo here. I'll try my level best to do this. So there is something called as about config in Firefox. Now Firefox browser is an open source browser. You can actually clone the code from GitHub onto your local machine and run your own Firefox. So as it's an open source browser, it gives you the ability to change the configuration. Let's try this. So it was about config. And this is this is the link you'll get. It will tell you that uh, if you you should not do this, but again, if uh, this is onto your own risk, the five uh, if you change something, Firefox may behave differently. Just let's let's accept this. The first thing you're going to change is tracking. So you just write tracking uh, into the URL bar and say enter. Okay. Do you see the third section here that says tracking protection enabled? Don't see it? So on the browser, you will get something like this, privacy.trackingprotection enabled. Normally, it is set to false because Firefox wants its users to have a normal browser. It wants to give them the choice to either use privacy settings or not. So if you just double click on the setting, if you just double click like this, it will set it to true or false. Similarly, you can also change the setting for resist fingerprinting. We just talked about fingerprinting, right? That they are trying to uniquely identify your browser. You can write privacy.resist fingerprinting and it's normally set to false, but you can again make it true. You can even disable cache. You can also tell the browser to not record your battery status. You can tell that the clipboard events can be put to false. Also, not track you through geolocation. This is all configurable changes uh, into your Firefox. I'm going to share this slide. So even if you're not able to see this right now, uh, you can go ahead and look at the slides afterwards. So let's talk about add-ons. How many people use add-ons on, for their browsers? What kind of add-ons do we use? Normally ad blocking. Anybody ad blocking? Right? How many people use ad block, ad blocker, like the, the actual name called ad block plus or ad block? Right? Okay. So let's talk about that. I was also an ad block plus user, but when I was trying, I was reading one of their blogs, there was something that they published called as acceptable ads. Do you guys think any ad should be acceptable? If you if you are actually trying to block ads, should an ad blocker slip through some specific ads? No, right? Why? Because if you are trying to use an ad block, its main job is to block ads, right? And if it is letting some ads through, it's not doing its job. The reason for that is ad block plus thought that there is something called acceptable ads because they wanted to make money. So don't, don't hold me accountable for what I'm saying here because I just read that on a blog post. But that really concerned me, so I moved to something called as U Block Origin. It's also an ad blocker that is created by the same guy who basically worked on Adblock Plus, but created his own fork from Adblock. And that's why I say that try and use this particular add-on called as U Block Origin. This will block your ads. The second one, is called the privacy badger. Privacy badger
attacher is an add-on that tries to uh, basically block your trackers. It is an add-on from Electronic Frontier Foundation called EFF. They work a lot into privacy and security areas and it's an open source organization. The third add-on is HTTPS everywhere. So there are a lot of websites that use HTTP protocol. Now HTTP protocol is not a secure protocol. HTTPS is a secure protocol. And if a particular website is using HTTP, I personally recommend to not use it. Specifically, if it is a bank website, specifically if it is doing some financial transactions, it can be easily intercepted. For example, one of the major threats for HTTP is the man in the middle attack, where someone will show that this is the main page of, of a website. You can put in your you, uh, username and password, but that is not the main website. That is like a clone of it. And then they get your information and then redirect you to the original website. Okay? So using HTTPS can, to a point, eliminate that risk. So uBlock Origin, three add-ons, uBlock Origin, Privacy Badger, and HTTPS everywhere. This is the basic set you should have. There are more privacy add-ons for every browser you are using. Just go to the, the Play Store or the add-on store and just write privacy and you'll get all the list of privacy add-ons. Okay, search. This is, this is an interesting topic. How many people here uh, use Google search. Google search? Okay. Everybody uses Google search because why? It's convenient. Right? The reason we use Google search is it knows so many things about you that it is able to give you a very customized result of search. But the problem there is that everything you type in that search bar is being tracked, is, is being profiled on your profile. Basically, they are trying to find data points around you. If you do not want to use Google search and you want to try something new which respects your privacy, try that to go. It's, it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice search engine. Their, um, their tagline itself says the search engine that does not track you. At least I believe when you say something like this on your first page. So uh, I think they are using Yahoo search in the background, but an anonymous Yahoo search. Okay? So Dr. Go, give it a try. It's not the same as Google, but it's good. Now, the first thing you will uh, you'll encounter when you go to Google, Dr. Go is it is not giving you results that are similar to Google. Why? Because it is not tracking you. It will take some time to get adjusted to Dr. Go, but I highly recommend it. The second search engine I would tell you or I would recommend is called CRX. CRX is like a meta search engine. If you really do not want any of your data going to any third party, you can even uh, host this onto your own server. You can also host this on your local machine and then send search queries and search parameters using CRX. But if you still want Google, if you still want to see the same results because you do not want to move away from Google, this is something which I would recommend you guys use. It's called Start Page. What Start Page does is it takes your query, anonymizes the query. I mean, when the query has a lot of metadata, the metadata means your name, maybe your IP address, your preferences, it's, it strips off all the metadata, only takes the query and posts it to Google. So if you want to do a small experiment, type something in Google, go to start page and type some and type the same thing in start page and compare the results. You will get a bit of a different results because maybe start page will take away the location, the battery status, and the type of profiling you're using. So give it a try. So I have five minutes to finish this up. So let's talk about passwords real quick. I would suggest if you are using passwords, that's the main protection, right? How many people use different, uh, same password everywhere? Why, 
the reason is, wh what is the reason? It's easy to remember, right? And you do not want to do, uh, maybe you do not want to take that extra effort of remembering two, three, four passwords. But let me tell you this. Does your car, does your house, does your lockbox, does your laptop, if you have a lock on it, have the same key, a single key? No, right? All your locks do not have the same key. So why does all your account has a single password? It's the same thing. If somebody gets hold of your one key, it can open all your locks. It can take your money, it can take your house, they can sit in your house when you're coming and offer you tea, right? They can do anything. It's the same online, right? Online life is actually real life. If you have the same key, if you have the same password for all your accounts, once, if someone knows your password, they can go to all your accounts, right? And take all the information. So, I would suggest the first thing you do is try and have different passwords for different accounts. Try that, at least. Maybe three passwords for multiple accounts, whatever fits you find. Try and create strong passwords. Also, so whenever we are sending a password, we are trying, uh, we are asked about security questions, right? So try and answer security questions like an extra password. Use a password manager, right? Like LastPass. Try and use two-factor authentication. And some new services like Firefox Monitor. Go search what Firefox Monitor is, it's amazing. Special that if you want to get out of systems, like Google, like it's an ecosystem, right? Go to this URL, it will give you options of all the services that you're using. For example, if you're using Google, um, say Gmail, what is the other service that you can use for privacy-based systems, right? This is the URL, go ahead and try it out. And yes, last but not the least, cover your webcam. <laughs> Everybody can watch. Cover it, okay? Next time you do not have a cover on your webcam, put some tape there. There are webcam covers that come in, will help you in your privacy as well. And thank you so much for this. How do you say this in Chinese? Shay Shay. there is one key that I have to take care of, how safe it is. So it's the same. It's like at least remembering one strong password. Keep it safe, right? And if you think that you cannot keep it safe, change it from time to time. Maybe once in a month, once in two weeks, change, change the master password. So rather than remembering five, six, ten different passwords, you can remember one master password for a password manager and change it whenever you think that it is getting compromised. Thank you. Any more questions? Hi. You just recommended to make a frequent password changes, but I think the latest some say some companies like Microsoft is suggesting to not uh, recommend changing password to users. But how does that work? <laughs> I don't know if 
Microsoft has some gain out of knowing people's passwords and keeping it same, but I would highly recommend change your passwords whenever you like. Change it. Because it will become more difficult for people to know about it. If you are using a service like Microsoft, I don't know if they do this, but if they are doing it, maybe you should not use their service. My question was misunderstood. I think a company like Microsoft used to say, uh, ask users to change passwords in like three or four months, uh, once, but they stopped doing that because it low, uh, lowered the security. So I wonder why, how it works with your suggestions. Uh, okay, so it's, it's a longer discussion, but I'll give you a short answer. Privacy and security are actually the two ends of the same thread. So if you have maximum privacy, you will, uh, you will compromise on security. If you have maximum security, you will compromise on privacy. Example, surveillance. Surveillance gives you maximum security on a nationwide level, but it is compromising privacy. You have to find a middle ground where there is good privacy, there is good security. Maybe Microsoft tried to strengthen their security and compromise user privacy. So you have to decide if you want from your companies that you're using your software from to talk about security only, privacy only, or both, and try and get into a middle ground. Let's talk about this if you're not convinced, but it's, it's a longer discussion. I don't want to eat into other speakers' times. Uh, uh,